January 11th, 2023. C.H. Spurgeon once said, We are too prone to write our trials in marble and our blessings in sand. Are you able to remember the good that God has done for you when you walk through trials? Hello, family and friends. I'm Kanoi, and we are on day 11 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365 using a chronological reading plan as laid out by the Bible Recap. As always, you can find in the description box below the reading plan where you can print it out and follow along. There are also other Bible study tools, the Hebrew Lexicon, the YouVersion app where you can follow along with a digital reading plan each day, and also a link to the Bible Recap itself where you can take a look at the podcast or the YouTube videos that will help you get an overview of what we read every single day. I first wanted to start off by just saying thank you. Thank you so much. I've gotten several messages in the past couple of days of people specifically saying, I see the hard work that goes into the videos that you're creating and I appreciate it. So I just want to say I appreciate your appreciation. I've written that in a couple of the comments and I don't do this for any kind of recognition or comments, but when I see them, it is well received. So thank you so much for seeing that. Something else I decided to do different is is post my Bible notes in the description box as well. You can find them in a Google Doc. I know several people have asked, and so I figured this is probably the best way for you to be able to either screenshot, print them out, and follow along if that will help you. Today we are reading the book of Job, chapters 29 through 31. This is the final round, the final bout of the battle of the speeches between the friends and Job before another friend comes along, as well as God stepping onto the scene. But before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for another day, Lord God. I thank you for every person who is here. I pray that you will open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to hear, to understand, and to receive every word and every revelation that you have for us today. I pray, Lord God, specifically for those who are suffering from cancer. Father, that you will bring your peace upon their hearts today, Lord, that you will bring comfort to them, and that you will increase their faith to know that this is not something they're suffering because they're getting some sort of punishment. Lord, but I pray that they will understand that there is a great picture here, God, and I pray that you will help them to see it. Let their hearts be set on you so that they will know that you will be working this out for good. I pray for those, Lord, who are waiting for a good report. We know you are our great physician, Lord God, Jehovah Rapha. We just claim your name today and we cry out to you today for healing, Lord. I pray for bodies to be healed and restored to their fullness. I pray for wholeness in families and marriages, Lord God, for those who feel like they may be unequally yoked with their partner. Father, I pray that you will bring them together in unity and help them to see the roles that you've created for them and to walk in those, Lord. I pray for the prodigal children, those sons and daughters, Lord, who may have gone astray, that parents are praying for, that parents are yearning for to come home. Bring them home, Lord. And I pray that when they do return, that there will be only open arms and love and grace for them. I pray for every person who does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, that they will open their hearts to you today. And I pray for those who are in need of a financial miracle, Lord God, that you, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, will bring it forth. You know every specific need, Lord, so we lay them out before you. We lay them at your feet. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Job 29, we hear the last discourse or the final argument to his friends. And he says, oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me. And it's interesting because in chapter three, he actually lamented the day he was born. And now he's saying, if only I could return to the former days. Verse three, when his lamp shone upon my head and by his light, I walked through darkness. So he's saying, can we go back to the days when I wasn't walking around blind? And the lamp shone upon my head actually symbolizes divine blessing and success. Verse 4, as I was in my prime when the friendship of God was upon my tent. The New King James Version also says the secret of God. So this could mean to have an understanding of God or to trust God. And if you think about it, I mean, you can really only be friends with God or with someone when you spend time with them. Later, we learn that Abraham was called a friend of God, and it was because he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was committed to God and the plans that he had laid out. And in verse 5, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. If Job is indeed talking about a day when he was blessed, 
the picture of children surrounding him is such a beautiful thing. It reminded me of when my grandma, who I only knew for about six months because she also passed away from cancer at a very young age, but I remember sitting at her bedside and she would read Bible stories to us. And this was only a couple of times, but it truly laid a foundation in my heart. I didn't come to know Jesus until I was about 11 years old. And then later on in high school, one of my friend's moms actually started a Bible study with me and a couple of other girls. And I just remembered this the other day and I reached out to my friend and I said, hey, can I get your mom's address? I would really like to thank her because as I was studying, I recalled a Bible verse that we memorized in this Bible study. And again, we only met a couple of times, but it was such a profound moment in my life that again laid out that foundation of who God was and who he would be in my life. And I felt a little bit convicted in this because I thought to myself, I used to read Bible stories to my kids, but now they're getting a little bit older. We've kind of stopped that. So on our way to school today, I actually asked them a couple of questions and I started telling them about the book of Job. I asked them, can you remember times when God was good to you? And we'll see this a little bit later as we read. And I explained to them that it's important to remember the times that God has blessed your life because when the trials hit, when the bad times hit, this is what is going to keep your faith alive. So I encourage you today, if you are a parent, if you have children, even the littlest things, reading them a Bible story, talking to them about blessings from the Lord, praying with them, praying for them. These things are so important in a family. And I encourage you to do that today. Start small, read a verse, memorize verses together. Just take the step to fortify your all's faith together as a family. Verse six, when my steps were washed with butter and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. So he's saying when life was smooth, can we go back to that time? Verse seven, when I went out to the gate of the city, when I prepared my seat in the square. So the gate of the city, this is similar to the modern courthouse. There was a gate that went into this city square or this town square. And this refers to his position that he had perhaps as a councilman or as a judge. Verse eight, the young men saw me and withdrew and the age rose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and laid their hand on my mouth or on their mouth. The voice of the nobles was hushed and their tongue stuck up to the roof of their mouth. So Job was well respected by both young and old, by the rich as well as successful. Verse 11, when the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it approved. So he would actually counsel others and his work was blessed through that. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him, the blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Now remember, his friends accused him otherwise. They actually said, you exploited the poor and you forgot the widow. Verse 14, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. So he was once clothed in righteousness, now clothed in worms. Verse 15, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy and I searched out the cause of him who I did not know. So he would help the blind. He would help the lame, help the, le the needy and anyone who was like how he is now. By the way, I actually like to keep a list near me whenever I'm studying so that I can write down my to-dos so I don't get distracted and start going to do laundry and all the other things that I need to get done throughout the day. So that's something I suggest doing is keeping a notebook handy so that you can write down your to-dos or any kind of appointments that you need to write down or something you need to attend to after you read. Carrying on, I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. So he says, he, I took a stand against evil. And this could perhaps mean his position as a judge. Verse 18, then I thought I shall die in my nest and I shall multiply my days as the sand. My roots spread out to the waters with the dew all night on my branches, my glory fresh with me and my bow ever new in my hand. So bows would be unstrung back in the day when they weren't in use. That way the wood would be able to maintain its strength and then they would restring it again. And once they restrung it, <laughs> trying to think of my English here, uh, that would rejuvenate the strength once again. So he's talking about the rejuvenation of his own vigor and might here. So he's longing for the good days, the good old days of, of glory. I'm my days of glory. I mean, I think we all probably have those moments where we're like, can we just go back to the good old days, especially in this day and age now? Can we go back to pre-COVID? Can we go back to pre-9-11? I mean, I'm sure every generation has those moments. And when he said, I shall die in my nest and I shall multiply my days as the sand, he's saying, I thought I would die peacefully. I thought my life was going pretty good. 
Verse 21, then listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel. So again, he would counsel other people. They would come to him for advice. Verse 22, after I spoke, they did not speak again and my word dropped upon them. They waited for me as for the rain and they opened up their mouths as the spring rain. So his words were refreshing to people just as rain was into an open mouth. Verse 24, I smiled on them when they had no confidence in the light of my face, they did not cast down. So he was an encourager, he was an uplifter. Verse 25, I chose their way and sat as chief and I lived like a king among his troops, like one who comforts mourners. He was a commander and he was a comforter. So ultimately here in chapter 29, Job is remembering all of the great things that the Lord had done for him. There are many times in the Bible where the Lord will say, remember. In fact, in Deuteronomy, he says, remember all the ways the Lord led you. And they will go on 14 more times to say, remember in the book of Deuteronomy. And then there are times when the Bible says, hey, you know what? Forget what is behind, press on toward what is ahead. So if it helps you in your times of trial, remember the good times, remember the things that the Lord has done. But if it's going to put you in a place of, man, I sure wish I could go back to the good old days. I don't think that's a place that God wants us to be in. But if it will help you to move forward and to put one foot in front of the other, just remember, remember, remember God was good to me. Remember God provided for me. Remember when God healed me. Remember when he was my comforter. Remember when he got me through that fire. Remember when he was with me in the fire. If you can remember those things to help you put one foot in front of the other to get to your destination, to get to that place of glory, then do it and write it down. Write down how God has blessed you. Write down how God has come through for you. Because that way, if you do forget, you can always go back and read it. So we go from Job in chapter 29, talking about all of the great things that God has done in his past. And now he goes back to lamenting the present. Verse one, but now they laugh at me, men who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. So he's saying life has completely reversed itself here. Verse two, what could I gain from the strength of their hands, men whose vigor is gone? Through want and hard hunger, they gnaw the dry ground by night in waste and desolation. They pick salt wort and the leaves of bushes and the roots of the broom tree for their food. They are driven out from human company. They shout after them as after a thief. In the gullies of the torrents, they must dwell in holes of the earth and of the rocks. Among the bushes, they bray under the nettles. They huddle together a senseless and nameless brood. They have been whipped out of the land. So he's talking about all of these young men who used to be the ones who would come to him for counsel, the ones who would get out of the way when he would walk down the road, now they're acting like a bunch of wild animals. They are basically like a pack of wild dogs that you would hear barking and yelping on the edge of town. I actually thought of coyotes because I live in Vegas and it's always the top of my mind every time I let my dog out to go to the bathroom. But that's what I thought of. That's what he was equating these men who are now kind of outcasts and they are putting themselves above him essentially. And in the next few verses, he goes on to talk about how they treat him. Verse nine, and now I have become their song and I am a byword to them. And I circled byword, I know I did it before, but I already forgot what it meant. And it basically means to be kind of this notorious example. Like I'm the one that they will talk about when they talk about how things have gone wrong for someone. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the side of me. Spitting in someone's face was the ultimate sign of disrespect in this culture, in this day. Verse 11, because God has loosed my cord and humbled me, they have cast off restraint in my presence. So saying now he's undone and they hold nothing back. Verse 12, on my right hand, the rabble rise. They push away my feet. So they're tripping me up. They cast up against me their ways of destruction. So they destroy me while I'm down. They're kicking me while I'm down. Verse 13, they break up my path. Otherwise, they throw obstacles in my path. They promote my calamity. They need no one to help them. So he's saying they're basically trying to ruin me. Verse 14, as through a wide breach they come, amid the crash they roll on. And he is showing how wide this door is open that people are coming through it. So this is a lot of people. They're coming at him from all sides. Verse 15, terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. So he's saying my honor, my dignity, my prosperity, all of it, it's gone. 
And verse 16, and now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken a hold of me. When he's talking about his soul, he's talking about his emotions. And then when he talks about his affliction, he is speaking of his physical body. Verse 17, the night racks my bones and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. So he is in agony here. Verse 18, with great force, my garment is disfigured. Garment is also referring to skin. It binds me about like the collar of my tunic. 19, God has cast me into the mire and I have become like dust and ashes. So he's saying God did this. Of course, we know God did not do this. He's saying God has basically picked me up and thrown me back down, face down into the mud. Verse 20, I cry to you for help and you do not answer me. I stand and you only look at me. So I was thinking of like a little kid in class with his hand raised saying, pick me, pick me. And no one is picking him. Verse 21, you have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. So he's saying you slap me around. Verse 22, you lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it and you toss me about in the roar of the storm. So again, you're picking me up and you're lifting me high only to throw me back down and make it hurt even worse. Verse 23, for I know that you will bring me to death. And I found it interesting that he says with so much conviction, for I know, whereas he said before, for I know my Redeemer lives. Now he's saying, for I know that you will bring me to death. So he's showing confidence in God in two different things. And he says, and to the house appointed for all living, which refers to the grave. Verse 24, yet does not one in a heap of ruins stretch out his hand and in his disaster cry for help? Did not I weep for him whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? He's saying, do you remember when I had compassion on people just like me? Verse 26, but when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil and never still. My days of affliction come to meet me. I go about darkened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. So he's saying, why isn't anyone responding to my cries? But not the sun, but not by the sun actually refers to mourning. So he is in mourning, again, in that depression, that deep, dark place. Verse 29, I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin turns black and falls from me. Yikes. And my bones burn with heat. I don't know if you can imagine the magnitude of his physical nature. I mean, his skin turning black, so it's basically scabbing and his skin is falling off. His bones feel like he is burning up with heat. Verse 31, my leer is turned to mourning and my pipe to the voice of those who weep. So Job has talked about the past, he's talked about the present, and now he's going to wager his future in chapter 31 in the final part of his speech to his friends. Job is making his final appeal. In fact, he makes an oath of innocence. In verse one, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? So he is claiming his innocence from lust here because the eye is the main avenue for temptation. You know, he is saying, I have not even looked at another woman that way. And I just wonder to myself, like, what are we looking at? You know, what are our eyes looking at? What are we watching? What are the things that we are allowing to kind of captivate our eyes and then, you know, sink down into our hearts? It's kind of food for thought. Verse two, what would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the almighty on high is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity. Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? So he's saying, doesn't God see my innocence? Verse five, if I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes and if any spot has stuck to my hands, then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. So in ancient courts, the accused would actually use this word if in a formula of an oath. So that's why we know he's taking an oath here. And this was called the oath of clearance. And that would that would swear their innocence, basically. And so he's saying, if I am guilty, let me be cursed. Verse nine, if my heart has been enticed toward a woman and I have lain in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down on her. For that would be a heinous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For that would be a fire that consumes as far as a baden and it would burn to the root of all my increase. 
Job's like, you know what? I know how bad adultery is. And guess what? I'm innocent of that too. Verse 13, if I have rejected the cause of my manservant or maidservant when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? So he's saying, aren't we all equal here? So he's talking about a misuse of authority or feeling superior. Yeah, we should all be that way. We should all feel that we're all on the same playing field, but unfortunately, it's not that way. In fact, Philippians 2 says, esteem every man as better than yourself. So he is saying, everyone is better than you at something, or someone is better than you at that thing. So we always have to look at people as better than us, you know, we're, and, and it's not a place of insecurity. It's actually a place of humility. And so Job actually uses this whole if-then formula plenty more times. And this is showing his confidence in his innocence and that he would actually be acquitted. In verses 16 through 23, he talks about if I have exploited the poor, then let everything that I've ever had be taken from me. He talks about the loss of his arm and the loss of an arm usually meant the loss of income, respect in life. So he is saying, if I have done this, in fact, take, take it all, which really, I mean, everything has already been taken from him, but he is just claiming once again his innocence from doing that. In verses 24 through 28, he talks about greed, idolatry, and he's saying, I am innocent of this too. Verse 26, if I looked at the sun when it's shown or the moon moving in its splendor and my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand. That's talking about an ancient custom when they used to kiss their hand before basically throwing a kiss to the gods. For I would have been false to God above. So he is proclaiming his faith in the one true God. Verse 29, if I have rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me or exulted when evil overtook him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. So he's saying, I've never been vindictive. I've never gloated over my enemies. Verse 31, if the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been filled with his meat? So he's saying, if I fed my face and let those around me go hungry. And 32, the sojourner has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. So he was always full of hospitality, always opening his doors to strangers. If I've concealed my transgressions as others do, AKA Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my heart. So he's saying, I never hid my sin behind closed doors. And I didn't become a recluse because maybe I feared what other people thought or I feared their gossip. And the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence and did not go out of the doors. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Again, he's saying, I wish I had a mediator. Here is my signature. So he is signing this oath. He's taking this oath. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps like a prince. I would approach him. So here he's starting to get a little bit cocky. I mean, he's starting to get a little prideful here. He's saying, you know, if only you could produce the indictment documents, I would put them on display myself because I know that they would be few and far between. So he's talking about himself as a prince. Like I would come into the courts of God like a prince with my crown on. So he's getting kind of prideful. And God is actually going to address this a little bit later about his lack of humility. Verse 38, if my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I've eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. So he's saying, if I took advantage of landowners and sowed in greed, return to me thorns. And the chapter concludes by saying the words of Job are ended. Woo, I always get so happy when we get to the end of the Bad Friends Big Debate. And I get excited because God is getting ready to step into the scene, but not before another man comes into the picture and actually rebukes both the friends and Job. And we'll read about that tomorrow. But here are some of the things that we can consider today. Considering all Job has lost, how frequently does he refer to his former possessions or wealth? And what are the things he seems to mourn the most? And I would take it one step further. 
What are some of the things that you would mourn the loss of? What are the things that you hold most dear or that are most important to you that if they were taken away, that you would mourn the loss? In chapter 31, Job considers all his ways to see if there's any unknown sin in his heart or life. So that's when he's saying, if I did this, if I did this, and it's saying to circle all of the ifs in the Bible and then read each if statement, taking the time to consider whether any resonate with you. If so, spend some time in repentance, asking God for his help to desire better things. And then for each if statement, consider what it reveals about what God loves and what he hates. Write a list of each of them. Here's a hint that she gives. The things God hates oppose or violate what he loves. For instance, God hates pride because he loves humility. So that's just some homework if you want to do it. If you're the type who loves to answer the questions, put them in the comments below. And as always, the comments are open for prayer requests, for encouragement for others, for letting us know what you're learning throughout these readings. And if you're in a place of confusion or in a place of, I don't know what this whole Christianity thing is about, but I know that I'm here, I wanna tell you that it is not by accident that you are here. You are here by a divine appointment. God has brought you here because he pursues you and he wanted your heart. So today we're gonna give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ if you've never accepted him as your savior. And what that means is that by accepting him as your savior, when we die, we know exactly where we're gonna end up for eternity. There's only two places it's either heaven or hell and by golly I want to go to heaven so I'm gonna keep saying this prayer of salvation and I hope that you will too let these words resonate from your heart as if they're your own so let's pray Heavenly Father I thank you so much for loving me I thank you Lord that you knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb I thank you that you wrote out a story that you knew from the beginning to the end what would happen in my life and that you are in control you are sovereign I thank you then for sending Jesus to die in my place place, knowing full well that I would sin and that I would not live a life of righteousness, but you love me too much to leave me in that and to let me die in that. So you sent Jesus to die, to shed his blood, to cover me and wash me clean of all of my sins, both past and future and also in the present. So I thank you, Jesus, for what you did, for coming, for dying, for rising again, and for your Holy Spirit that is now alive in me as I accept you as my Savior. I repent of my sins and I walk with you, Lord, from this day forward. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, that wraps it up. Tomorrow we will be reading Job chapters 32 through 34. This is where we're going to hear from Elihu. I think that's how you say his name. And he is going to be talking to both the friends and Job. And the story starts to begin to unfold to give us even more hope for the future. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Until then, I bid you a big ahui ho. God bless you and aloha.